afternoon, everybody, and apologies for a slightly delayed start. There was some technical excitement with uh, WebEx there, but I think we are now all coming into order. And thank you so much for joining us in the first event from Europa Bio as part of European Biotech Week 2021. So our event today is called Turning Science into a Sustainable and Healthy World and really looks at the key principles that enable science to be applied into use both for people and for planet. So we, I'm really delighted to be uh, to have an excellent set of, of uh, participants today. Our webinar is being recorded and you will be able to catch up with it on YouTube. You can also directly add Q&A for our panelists and please do not hesitate to uh, add anything into the chat box so that we can pick it up and answer it later in the uh, webinar. As I said, we have a really great panel of participants today. So it's a really interesting insight into how this works in different um, contributions and the role of the regulatory agencies in achieving that. So what we will do is um, hand over to the first of our presenters this afternoon, who is Anna Maria Bravo from com a large company IFF, which is really very active in the sort of food and feed and fragrances area. And it's an extremely interesting aspect of biotechnology that many products and processes are driven through biotech into the food and feed sector. So without me carrying on talking, I will hand over to Anna Maria and we look forward to hearing about how IFF contributes via the regulatory pathway. Thank you, Clara. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, which is delightful. Okay. Good start. Good afternoon, everybody. And um, I'm really grateful to be part of this, uh, this webinar. So thank you, Europa Bio, for the opportunity to, to participate. Um, a few words about IFF. Indeed, we are an industry leader in innovative and sustainable solutions for a wide range of different sectors, ranging from health to scent to food, beverages, animal feed, but also renewable energies and consumer and cleaning and personal care products. So really your products of everyday life in, in many aspects. We develop many of our biological ingredients using biotech, which means that we use microbes, whether it's bacteria, yeast, or fungi, as kind of mini cell factories to produce all these valuable products. Now, this isn't anything new, especially for food, because it's been thousands of years that humans have um, used microbes to develop their wine, their cheese, their bread. Um, and um, through the years and in the last 100 years, we've used um, um, these microbes in a more improved way as technologies improved so that we could make them be more effective. And it's really since the last, um, and since the 1980s, that we've also been able to do genetic modifications to these microbes with techniques that you may know under the names of GMOs or gene editing or CRISPR-Cas to really be more precise and predictable in the way that we um, tweak these microbes for making the products that you use in, in your food and other products, as, as I mentioned earlier. So examples of these would be an enzyme that is used in bread making um, so that the, um, the bread doesn't go stale and it still stays fresh longer. And this is really attractive from a sustainability perspective because it reduces the huge amounts of waste of stale bread that we throw away um, every day in many parts of our world. Or another example could be a milk protein um, that is used for making all these dairy products. We can now make it um, through these microbes for making vegan cheese. So you can see and you can imagine that regulations and the guidance from the food safety authorities are essential to ensure that the food is safe that is placed on the European market. And these guidance for us are like frameworks that we use to collect all the safety data on the microbes, on the manufacturing them, the safety studies of the products that we make, but also the exposure studies um, before they really go out in the marketplace. And a company like ours, we produce many new microbes and, um, and products per year for the food sector. And the process for the full safety assessment can be quite lengthy and costly. To give you an idea, it can take two to three years to make a product, um, to make it and also do all the safety studies for it to be authorized by the authorities to be on the market. And it can cost between two, three million uh, euros for a single food enzyme. So it is good that in, at EFSA, they do have some processes to um, fast track this 
for example, if a microbe is of a group of microbes that has a safe history of use, then they can be fast tracked and less the whole full um, assessment process doesn't have to take place. Um, and in our view, this is kind of, it's good for us to, to uh, because it promotes innovation as we make many of these products per year. We would want EFSA to take this one step further and develop a broader umbrella beyond bacteria to other microbes as fungi and more yeasts that we do use for making these products, but it's going in the right direction. And also at the international level, the body um, that is used to harmonize safety assessment studies, JECFA, is also recently going in the direction of uh, establishing the presumed safe progeny strain, which is really good for promoting innovation. Now, if we move to novel foods, um, regulations also guide the way novel foods are made, but do they really promote innovation is one aspect I would like to bring to the table. Because while we agree that they have to be as safe as other products that are in the market, you know, the traditional ones, regulations can either be too strict or cumbersome, and that may discourage industries from innovating because of the uh, lengthy processes that we have to put that in place. So a novel food is considered um, a food that has no history of safe use, which makes sense. It has to go through the lengthy processes, but it also says if it was made with a new process. So if we go back to the example of the milk protein, if that milk protein um, is, it's actually a proteins that are well characterized and we want to make them with a microbe that is also well characterized as a process. But the fact that we are making this novel protein in this microbe then it is considered a novel food, and therefore it's, um, it has to go through additional um, safety proceed, um, tests uh, in order to be authorized. And we just wonder if it makes sense, because at the end, the, the end molecule is the same, irrespective of which process was used to make it. And that brings me to my next message, which is, we really believe that we need to move to a more product-focused regulation rather than regulations that are based on the processes and the methods that were used to make them. At the end of the day, the, the end products need to be safe and we need to do all the safety studies for doing that, but it shouldn't matter which way we, we uh, which technology we use to make them. Um, and so here, the other final point that I wanna make is that these new technologies that we're using uh, today, it's the latest is gene editing and CRISPR-Cas, but these new technologies will continue to develop very fast. And so will regulations based on processes be able to keep up with this pace? We can't expect regulators to keep to the same speed that we at industry or academia are doing with these technologies. And so we therefore would really need a more structured opportunities for a real exchange on emerging technologies together with the authorities, but also with civil society so that we can build more trust in the innovation that we're currently developing. So this in conclusion, in my opening remarks, regulations and guidance from authorities are essential to ensure the safe ingredients and food are placed on the market, irrespective of how they were made or whether they're labeled as traditional or novel foods. And secondly, the EU needs to adapt its regulations to assess these efficiently um, emerging novel foods that are gonna be coming more and more and the new technologies, because we're going to need innovation to be part of the solution for meeting all these sustainability and climate change goals that we have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. And it's, it's really amazing when you see the new food, the interesting new foods coming out, particularly when you look at things like the cultured meats, which are often in the headlines these days. And these are all exciting technologies of that need to be dealt with through regulatory processes so that we can all benefit from them, both from a health perspective and from a sort of environment perspective as well. So I'd like to jump over now, I'd like to jump sectors into healthcare and invite Damien Gilkison from CSL Bearing to unmute himself and just give a little bit of introduction about CSL, how CSL Bearing addresses its product development through the regulatory framework. Thanks, Claire, and good afternoon. It's a privilege to be part of this event to mark the beginning of European Biotech um, Week 2021. My name is Damien Gilkerson. I've been invited to talk for a few minutes about um, something very dear to our heart, and I hope it's going to be dear to yours too. And that is how CSL Bearing makes innovation available through the regulatory framework in Europe for patients living with rare diseases. 
So to jump into the subject, I think it's really important to understand that living with a rare disease is an immense burden, often associated with long, I'm sorry, lifelong suffering and shorter lifespans. Oftentimes with limited or no treatment options available, and even when treatment is available, important unmet needs remain for many patients. Currently, there are approximately 30 million people in Europe living with a rare condition or a rare disease, and 95% of those are without a treatment today. So CSL has a long and successful history in addressing the needs of patients with um, rare and ser serious um, diseases. And we're now in the process of investing in gene and cell therapies to bring the next wave of breakthrough medicines to patients with rare and serious life-threatening disease diseases such as haemophilia. We've got a very long history in some of these um, disease areas and based on three core platforms, CSL Bearing has brought innovation to patients in the form of plasma proteins, recomb recombinant product products, and soon to be gene therapy for patients living with haemophilia B. But in order to address the needs of patients with rare diseases, a strong incentive ecosystem to support innovation is absolutely critical. The European Orphan Regulation has, the, has been the cornerstone in enabling advancement in science and innovation for patients with rare diseases. And to achieve all orphan designation, applications must satisfy three core criteria, which are tr treatment prevention or diagnosis of a disease that is life-threatening or chronically debilitating, a prevalence of no more than five per 10,000 of um, population, or it must be unlikely that marketing of the medicine would generate sufficient returns to, to, to justify the investment needed for its development. And lastly, no satisfactory method of diagnosis, prevention, or treatment of the condition concerned. More recently, the European Pharmaceutical Strategy, which comprises of 65 measures across three strategic priorities, which are addressing unmet medical needs, along with enabling access and affordability, supporting a competitive and innovative industry in Europe, which is absolutely critical. And um, uh, lastly, the focus on resilience of supply and sustainability. Hopefully, um, with these two sort of frameworks or um, pieces of legislation, we will continue to see this incentive framework evolve and develop over time. I think it's really critical to, to think about balance and balance of how these measures are going to be in, implemented. So, for example, the focus on unmet needs should not further restrict um, incentives where treatments do exist, but new technologies that can help ex, uh, um, address outstanding um, unmet need can continue to flourish and bring much needed benefit to patients. Now, the author um, regulation currently in place provides a suite of incentives to encourage development of orphan de designated medicines and includes protocol assistance, which, which uh, manifests in the form of EMA providing advice on the most appropriate way to generate robust evidence on a medicine, um, on a medicine's benefits and risks. This goes under the banner of prime market exclusivity, which lasts currently um, 10 years and procedure fee reductions. All of these are very welcome incentives that certainly facilitate investment for rare diseases for patients in Europe. But to continue, we need to really have adequate incentives, predictability, and regulatory agility that sort of are the bedrock of how we continue to foster innovation for patients in Europe. The hurdles in R&D are significant. Companies face development barriers, companies like CSL Bearing and many others, where only one in 10 clinical development assets entering clinical trials ever make it to market. And in rare diseases, we face greater risks, uncertainties and challenges along the development process, mainly due to disproportionately lower numbers of patients who can participate in clinical trials to generate the required standard of evidence and beyond of that, a low number of patients who could potentially benefit from these um, treatments if approved. So I think anybody that sort of um, operates in this space will certainly acknowledge the need for very strong um, support and incentives to continue this investment.
I think when you take a closer look at gene therapy, as I've already alluded to, this is an area that CSL Behring are actively pursuing um, currently. It requires that transformative innovations can only be successful if the system surround that surrounds them is ready to support their uptake. And our ultimate gain goal has to be that we reach the patient. So for gene therapies, patient access may be hampered by challenges related to evidence availability, data assessment, reimbursement policies, funding models, as well as healthcare systems, infrastructure and readiness, which requires a future-proof future regulatory system that supports the development of new approaches for evidence generation to facilitate downstream decision-making, including um, the use of new analytical and digital technologies, whether that be real-world evidence, real-world data, or artificial intelligence. In particular, in the area of rare diseases and novel therapies such as advanced therapeutic medicinal products, we believe that continued collaboration between the European Medicines Agency, national health authorities, and HTA bodies related to method methodological standards is very, very important. The European Commission and, and governments all have a key, key role to play in realizing the full potential that gene therapies and other ATMPs can deliver to patients in Europe, which requires healthcare policymakers, authorities, patients, industry, and the broader HCP community to all work together to understand the current limitations and burdens of treatment regimens, recognize the unique potential of gene therapy when it comes to addressing important unmet medical needs, promote the development of appropriate assessment methodology to capture the significant clinical and economic benefits of gene therapy innovation, and last but by no means least, create new and innovative payment models that reflect the long-term value of gene therapies and other ATMPs. So in summary, I think we're facing an increasing sophistication in product innovation. Thus, we need a fit for purpose regulatory strategy better prepared for the future. The regulatory system is often behind the science and we really do need to close that gap. And we'd like to call for stakeholder collaboration to look at the new ways to be prepared for future technologies in Europe to really help patients living with rare diseases on a day to day basis. So. Thank you for your time and for listening. Over to you, Claire. Thanks, Damien. And I think that's a really great insight into what we've already, when you work in the sector, you really understand this, that the invention stage is often sort of the first 5% of the journey. And the rest of it is really about how you bring it safely to its final destination. So I'm going to stay within the healthcare space now and invite Emmanuel Voisin from Voisin Consulting to unmute and just explain about, you know, you are specialists within a regulatory environment and how you see the role of regulations and how you play a role in enabling companies to reach market successfully. Okay, hello everybody and thank you Claire for giving me this opportunity to participate in this uh, great event today. So basically at Voisin Consulting Life Sciences, what we do is to accompany, to assist startups, biotechs, and medtechs in their uh, plan to develop and then bring to the market their products, drugs, and medical devices. And within drugs, we all obviously have the biologics as well as the new chemical entities. So basically, uh, we are a group of 220 people with uh, consultants in different countries and continents. And uh, our specificity is most importantly to bridge Europe and the, the US, meaning EMA and national European agencies together with FDA and also an MPA in China. So at this point, um, I would like to stress something that has been uh, said more or less by the Anna Maria as well as Damian, which is really to, to see how science, that is innovation, is, is um, prompting the regulations, meaning that um, when a startup company comes up with a very, very innovative product or sci a scientific or technology, then this technology will generate something new in the regulations, maybe a new 
uh, guideline, maybe more. And at the end of the day, this new guideline or this new regulation is going to support the marketing authorization or the C mark of the product. Therefore, this innovative product will reach the market. But in the meantime, uh, the science and the in innovation was still boiling in, um, at, at the, in the laboratories. And basically, this second generation of science is going to push forward again the regulatory system. So it, at the end of the day, it's a virtuous cycle that is always advancing both the science to allow it to reach the patients and the regulations that allow the marketing and uh, the, the registration of the new products that are really outside of the old regulations, I would say. So this is a principle that we exploit, that we use every day, and that we, we really thank the regulatory agencies for being so, uh, you know, Damien, you said there is a, um, a delay. Yes, of course, and this delay is, unavoidable. However, if you take, for example, the, exam the, 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 the case of COVID, I think the agencies were able to um, accommodate uh, the new science pretty fast, and they approved those products, namely medical devices, drugs, vaccines, uh, in a very, very short time frame. And I would like to recognize that. So when it comes to speeding up the process, then they can and they do as much as they can with the means they have, of course, and with the resources they have. So that to me is uh, extremely important. Now, um, now I was looking for, when preparing this session, I was looking for one message that I could um, convey here. And I was looking all over in everything we do every day, and it's tons of things that we do and a lot of different areas. But my selection was CMC, chemistry manufacturing and controls, because that is where I think the, uh, there's a lot of innovation and there is a lot of precautions to take when you, you develop this, this type of products. And I would like to stress a couple of points on this basis. Uh, first of all, in CMC, you have to, you, you, you need to have a quality uh, target product profile because this is, in fact, the end product of what you're looking for. So if you have your goal and your ultimate objective, then you'll come back, you will create the program that will lead to this TPP target product profile by um, establishing all the studies and programs that you're going to, to need in order to reach your goal. So in fact, there's no danger you can produce in data that are not useful because you're starting from the, the end point and you're coming back forward. So the TPP, the quality TPP and the TPP in general are of great importance. Then uh, another point in CMC that is very important is the fact that you have to plan on your different batches. There's the non-clinical batches, there's then the toxicology batches, and ultimately the GMP batches. And all this has to be orchestrated extremely, extremely uh, carefully, because um, if it's not anticipated, not planned, then you are going to have delays in the, um, in the CMC program. And today, um, more than ever, you have to make sure that there is no, well, that, that the, the CDMOs and CMOs uh, that you're choosing uh, are available and have a slot for you. Because with the COVID, um, especially these days, we have seen huge delays. And, and that is something that needs to be, unfortunately, that needs to be planned and taken into account in the timing of the of the development. And uh, finally, the release testing and characterization are becoming more and more important these days and need a lot of scrutiny when when um, doing your your um, CMC development plan. So basically, uh, that is something that needs to be thought of with a sort of a panel of experts in each of the micro areas that this um, brings along with. 
So at this point, um, and, and yeah, one last point, um, viral safety is a major concern with the agencies. So that is also a, a point that needs to be really, really taken uh, into consideration early on. So at this point, what I'd like to, to do is kind of paraphrase uh, uh, what was said before about the fact that the, the regulations are essential to ensure the safety and efficacy of the drugs or the safety and performance of the medical devices. And new technology really brings new regulations, whereas new regulations bring new technologies to patients. So that's what I wanted to say, Claire. Well, thank you very much indeed, and that was really nicely put. And indeed, it reminded me very much of what we often saw in the headlines when we were going through the whole vaccine production thing, in that the immense complexity of the things that require regulatory approval before a product is available to a patient. And so even when some vaccines, some vaccine had been manufactured in some places, they could not be used because the place where they were being manufactured had not yet received approval. So it's, you know, it's amazing how complex and how layered the regulatory requirements are, particularly around yes. novel medicine. So thank you very much, Emmanuel. And I go to our very last uh, contributor in the first part of this webinar, and we go back into the food space. And I would really like to invite Wolfgang, Wolfgang Geldman to uh, unmute himself now from EFSA and join us to explain explain the role that EFSA has in terms of enabling safe products and processes for food. So Wolfgang, if you'd like to unmute yourself and say hello. Hopefully he is on his way shortly. Okay. Let me see. No, he's still muted. So we continue with our WebEx excitement. I will see if I can unmute him myself. No. So I will ask our administrator, Martina, if it's possible to change. Ah, what now can you hear me? Ah, yes. Yes, we have you. But you can still, you cannot see me, right? I cannot see you, but we will That's... take your words of wisdom um, okay. as an excellent substitute. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, I was invited to to talk about how the European Food Safety Authority is ensuring safety, uh, safe and novel foods in Europe. Uh, I'm myself. I'm senior scientific officer in 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 a nutrition unit, and I'm largely responsible for for novel foods for their safety assessment. Uh, I, I would like to say that uh, innovation, of course in the food chain is not only through novel foods, but also in food enzymes, additives, packaging, there is everywhere uh, innovation. Nevertheless, I will today focus on novel foods. Um, what are novel foods? They are foods that have not been consumed to any significant degree in Europe. So that may include foods that have a history of consumption in other countries, but very often they are entirely new products, uh, which uh, have a new chemical, uh, structure, a new molecule, or an extract from a source that has not been used before uh, for food production. And we have now, uh, let's say, newer, uh, the latest novel food regulation that was adopted uh, 2015, but it fully came into force only in 2018. So we have uh, almost four years since uh, the new novel food regulation came into force. And since then, uh, EFSA has received uh, more than 200 novel food applications and the European Commission more than 400 novel food applications. And that compares, uh, it's more than double than what uh, EFSA and the Commission have received in the 20 years from 1997 to, to uh, 2017. Or in other words, we are now are getting 10 times more applications under the new novel food regulation as compared to the old one. And I think from the pure numbers, I, I would consider this isn't a success. We still struggle a bit. What was exactly the reason why we are facing now so many more applications than before? I think it was because the old novel food regulation was enormously burdensome in 
terms of time and uh, uh, costs involved, while also the new one, uh, it will certainly take, uh, my guess is uh, close to two years, when you consider a validation period from the commission, nine months for EFSA, and six months time for the commission and member states to implement it, to authorize them, the novel food. So it still takes at least one and a half years. In practice, I would say two years with the validation period. We also have the possibility of clock stop that may also extend the duration, but uh, clock stop, I would not only see the negatively in sense that it's extending the, the whole procedure, but it is also a opportunity for applicants to complete the data that may otherwise be considered insufficient by our experts and then may result in a, in a negative opinion. So we are using clock stops uh, to go back to applicants, then they have the possibility to request a clarification telecom conference we meet one or two hours um, and uh, give background and, and try to guide applicants to uh, to properly address uh, the questions we have. Um, Ten times more application than before was EFSA prepared. Did we expect it? No, we did not expect, um, but we quickly adapted. We could, uh, we could, we got a few posts from the European Commission. We also shifted uh, resources within EFSA from other units to the nutrition unit. And up to now, we have not uh, uh, missed any deadlines in under the new novel food regulation that uh, gives us now a deadline of nine months while the old one uh, did not give us a, a legal deadline as such. What are the strong trends in novel foods? They are clearly alternative protein sources, uh, insects, uh, plant-based proteins, such as from water lentils, with chia protein assessed, uh, protein from monk beans, rape seeds, but also algae. Um, and uh, more recently, uh, we also got the first uh, application for cell cultured, uh, but not meat. Uh, it's uh, upper cell culture. Uh, but we also are aware that uh, sooner or later, we also may get our first uh, cell culture meat uh, to be assessed. We also have a lot of novel carbohydrates, fiber, prebiotics, and, and they all may have or may not have certain function. That is often the interest behind the novel food that an applicant uh, has an idea about uh, the potential function uh, of, of a novel food. Food supplements is always uh, of big interest. We get a lot of plant extracts, uh, got first applications for CBD, cannabidiol, um, microorganism derived novel foods. I would say these are big trends, uh, what we're facing among the hundreds of applications we are dealing now. How are we helping applicants? Of course, we have a guidance like all other regulated products. Our guidance for novel food is, is consistent in, in, the, in terms of uh, the demand as compared to food additives or other guidelines in EFSA, the, the risk assessment is basically following and, and, and similar to other uh, products which are intended to be new, newly introduced in the food chain. There is a focus on the production process because novel foods uh, sometimes have a novel production process. Um, novel production process, they may also introduce uh, new residuals uh, from, from reagents or from the source, if we use a new source to extract a certain component, for example. Um, we have in EFSA um, a catalog of services, which uh, provides all the services we are, we are offering to applicants. We have a dedicated support for small and medium sized enterprises. Uh, where uh, where we give uh, spe specific uh, support and and more close report more close support let's say for small and medium enterprises which are the majority of our applicants. Generally, we have guidance. Of course, we always have uh, when we have a new guidance info sessions with stakeholders. We have an online questionnaire service. Uh, that can be used, that should be used by applicants. We have paperless online submissions. Uh, on demand, we offer clarification conferences following a clock stop letter by EFSA. And 
Yeah, we are aware uh, novel food applications are costly, burdensome, but I think we also have to balance this with uh, the huge market in Europe. Okay, not anymore 500 million after Brexit, but still some hundred of uh, million of uh, consumers. So a certain, let's say, minimum criteria and, and safety must be ensured, uh, whether it's a small enterprise or a larger enterprise. And there will be always some costs uh, involved uh, and it is not cheap, we agree on that. Um, that's something what EFSA cannot solve. Uh, of course, we have to, to work within the, the legal framework. And you may also, I'm sure you know that also EFSA is not, not uh, involved in, in new legislations as such, but basically we are, our part is then to to do the safety assessment within this uh, new reg regulation. But considering the figures I have presented at the beginning, I think the new one is at least compared to the old one already big success. At least that's my, my perception so far. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Wolfgang. And I think it, the, the, the amount of activity in the novel foods area makes me really excited for European biotechnology because it's such an important area that we're working in right now. If we're looking at the dual requirements for Europe to become more innovative, to develop next generation production of all things, um, as well as um, economic, you know, higher economic performance and whilst addressing climate change and meeting, meeting sustainable development goals as well, the role of food in Europe will be incredibly important to, to achieve that. So it makes me really happy that we're seeing so many new applications coming through. Although, of course, that makes a huge amount of work for uh, EFSA in the process. But I would really like to invite our panelists to put their cameras back on now, and we will go into a Q&A session to look at specific aspects of what they do linked to their regulatory, linked to regulatory requirements and the resources that are need needed here. So um, I'm also pleased to welcome into the panel Decibel Bora from Foisin, who will be joining us for some of the answers as well. So I'm going to start by going right back to the beginning and talking to the companies in the room. It's like, say, how much do regulatory requirements in Europe influence your choice of products to develop? And so, for example, you could have two really great scientific options for a product both which might have the same potential value and benefit. How do Europe's regulatory frameworks influence what you decide to develop? So I'll start with Anna Maria first, if that's okay. So what, what do you discuss when you're looking at the next product to develop? Thanks, Claire, and, and thank you, Wolfgang, also for, for your intervention. Well, I think here you say the choice of product. Um, what we do is we, we work um, with our customers to understand what their needs are. And our customers are usually big consumer brand companies that are also look, listening and looking at what the consumers are looking for. So it's not rather the choice of the product where regular, regulatory requirements influence what we're doing, but it's more on the method that we would choose. Um, going back to what I was saying earlier about depending on which method it is, we would be considered, the product would be considered either um, a novel food or just another uh, product to be approved. So I'll give you another example of probiotics, uh, which are uh, microbes that we use to um, increase the health um, of our intestinal flora of bacteria that we have. Um, we could be improving the, the performance of those probiotics um, through different methods. Um, we could be using very fine-tuned ways of improving them to, for example, remove an antimicrobial resistance that they may have. Um, and that could be done through a technology like gene editing. Um, but if we do it that way, then it would be considered a novel food and therefore it triggers this process, which understandably has to ensure the safety of that product. But if, if the same end product of that probiotic would be used uh, made using other technologies that are, are not considered novel, like random mutagenesis, which usually just do, as the word says, random uh, modifications in the DNA in different parts to, and, and you're selecting the end product of the microbe, depending on the performance, then that is not considered a novel food. So here, um, two same 
um, uh, same end products of probiotics made with different methods, that poses a question for us to say which one will we we use? And of course, um, you know, if the if the customer wants it, and we will we will entail down the path of a novel food application. But indeed, we just challenge whether this really makes sense. That's a really that's a really great example because I remember way back in the day during my PhD, uh, people were generating novel types of plant using random mutagenesis. And uh, so it's fascinating. It's a great example of how the science moves on so incredibly quickly so that you are now achieving the same outcomes, but with different methods. However, the regulatory structures were built around the previous generation of methods in many cases. So I think that's a really great example. So if I move then over to the medical side and go to Damien in uh, CSL bearing, you know, what example would you give in terms of regulatory and, and access questions deciding what you develop? I think you are possibly muted, Damien. How many times am I going to do that before I let <laughs> press the button? Sorry. Um, so similar to Anna Maria, I think we always start with the sort of um, patient in mind, albeit a, a patient in our in our world and really understand what the unmet needs are for a given sort of asset candidate. Um, and from a mechanistic point, how, how would that sort of um, bring value to the sort of patient ultimately? Now, the, the regulatory framework, I think, is evolving on a sort of um, fairly rapid scale when I consider the pathway which I talked about during my short talk in terms of whether you achieve orphan designation or not. And sort of all of those things do provide guidance and the pathway to get an asset from, you know, early stage through to clinical through to approval. Um, I think the key sort of um, area that I would shine a light on um, as it relates to regulatory interfaces is in the pharmaceutical world now with the increasing sort of healthcare um, system pressures, not least that have been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic, we're seeing greater levels of um, scrutiny and also data um, requirements from payers. Now, they're not a regulator in the truest sense of the world word, but in terms of how they interface with um, agencies, whether they be in Europe or other um, countries, is, is becoming increasingly um, complicated because what are or what the data required to um, successfully navigate a registration procedure is now no longer oftentimes sufficient for payer negotiations from a pricing and reimbursement um, perspective. And I think in terms of the question you're putting on the table, oftentimes we're having to um, gaze into the crystal ball a little bit in terms of anticipating any regulatory sort of changes. I'll use the gene therapy example where you have the GMO legislation or genetically, sorry, genetic mo modified organism legislation in Europe and slightly different in the US. Then you sort of fast forward and you say, okay, you navigate that. Hopefully you can get and benefit from some advice on the way through, through prime designation, all very helpful. And I think as an industry, we're very grateful for that. But then when you get to the sort of ultimate um, decision point, which is, is this product safe and efficacious to approve by the commission through the centralized procedure? And you come away with, yes, this, this is um, sufficient. You then butt up against the potential sort of um, higher sort of level of data um, requirements from payers that hasn't been factored into the clinical study design or the clinical development program, which throws in additional sort of considerations for how you navigate the regulatory sort of landscape. And then ultimately, as I mentioned, our, our goal is to ensure that patients can benefit from innovation. And unless we have the right data package for regulators plus payers, that oftentimes can be rate limiting and cause delays throughout that, that process. 
No, that's great, thank you. And again, it shows the complexity, and especially if you're looking at this from perhaps a small company perspective, where you've come in with a really nice new technology, but you you're not as a small company, you're not really in a position to think right the way through to some of those sort of payer and market access questions, because it may be different by the time you get there from when you started, even if you knew about it from when you start up your company. But it shows what a complex pathway medicines and foods have to travel and how important it is to have expert partners and advice all the way along because just having great science is not enough to get your product successfully sort of reimbursed and then they're into the market but that's 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 great thank you damien i think this the all of our questions linked together this afternoon so the next one is how do Europe's regulatory agencies help you plan for novel technologies, particularly those that are, you know, may not have been through approval processes before? And this is this is a really interesting one that we've already touched on a little bit. And I'll throw it back to Wazan to start from the medicine side. Uh, if you guys want to uh, contribute how the regulatory agencies support novel technologies. Yes, and uh, um, thank you for, for giving the floor. Uh... Manuel, if you want, if you allow me to to take this one on board. <laughs> so um, I think in order to open up the, the the this part, I think that I need to jump into uh, one of the comments made by by Damien, uh, which is something that uh, maybe that is a bit of a divergence from the initial plan. That is to say, how do you make it happen from the beginning? I think that it's very mo it's more and more important, and it's acknowledged in the previous. Uh, uh, from the previous uh, meetings um, and minutes to identify and acknowledge that going uh, uh, uphill for the marketing authorization to be granted uh, it, it does not prevent you from the fall on the other side of the cliff or the down down the, down the hill that say the, put your product on the market I, I think that the developers that there's no direct how can I say process by which one could uh, imagine or develop a drug because the environment and the landscape is in never changing world and moment. And uh, we mentioned the innovation that triggers regulatory um, uh, insight that is modifying itself and impacting the innovation and so forth. So price and reimbursement is probably the holy grail that is uh, sought during the development of a drug. But there are hints that help you, or at least raise the finger while you develop a drug. And uh, we mentioned orphan drugs, we mentioned Pediatric tools, that's a pediatric investigation plan, which are mandatory in Europe, especially the PIP. Uh, and there are elements and hints there where, where the, I would say the, the comparison, whether direct or indirect during your drug development, uh, has to happen to position your product. Because at the end of your PIP compliance check, uh, you need to make sure that everything is fine. When you do and want to maintain your orphan drug designation, Apart from the fact that you need to compare yourself to the existing treatments with regards to the similarities, also the significant benefit that kicks in. And that's something that may need to be taken into account at maybe not the last stage, but even already when you balance the benefit risk of your product versus existing treatments in some instances, whether you like it or not, you end up into discussions with an EMA where you are. There's a trade off. You keep your ODD or you give it up. And uh, yeah, the balance is whether you get your market application, the authorization is that, uh, of your product or, or not. That's, that's sometimes a, a wake up call at one point for the applicant. But coming back and reminding the, the, the story about the drug development, um, something that we need to bear in mind. You come to visit the authorities or land into Europe, or even as a European, when you want to develop your drug, there is this uh, interesting um, a network of uh, the so-called EU innovative network, which is a combination of the European agency and the head of medicines agencies representing the 27 member states. Um, and, and where, in fact, there is a kind of a fostering environment to pamper your drug in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in its development, dependent on what stage you are. Because some developers are either super early and they want to have an understanding. So there's uh, this uh, uh, ITF tool, the uh, task force, 
but also also the national agencies do that do have their own innovative offices innovation offices to better probably craft your early stage development into human because as you should as everyone should understand and and, reco and recollect as much as we have this umbrella handled by the european agency there's uh the, the within the remit of the national agency because of the of the subsidiarity principles you, you have to conduct your trials under the remit of the Euro, of, of the national agencies and the ethics uh, committees in, in a specific immediate environment so the, the the selection, the right selection of the participant agency to help you out, nav start navigating the maze. I wouldn't say the, uh, the, the the labyrinth of the Minotaur, but at least to find your way out as an Ariana thread, how to uh, identify also the tools you can place at work. I mean, not all the bells and whistles need to be there at the beginning, but there is an yeah, echoing what uh, Emmanuel said, you definitely need to understand what kind of product you want to use over the development. Even though you don't have an idea, you need to plan for it uh, to at least make the first test and the entry into human with an acceptable product. And in the end, get the market with the right product as well. And all the little tweaks uh, to make sure that the comparability is there helps you out. So it, uh, certainly uh, the EU uh, innovative uh, innovation network helps. Uh, and then the different tools such as uh, ITF prime ATMP designation for complex biology, such as the cells, cell gene therapy, GMOs, and you name it. And again, the question mark about the GM, uh, GMO legislation, which is handled at national level. So it's a, it's a, it's a true interface between agents. Uh, one, one last thing is not to forget about uh, the interconnectivity between uh, the EMA and the FDA, and uh, in the context of this, uh, uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, there is a, a lot of uh, a mutual, how can I say, uh, communication. In the end, the outcome is specific per agency, but in the end, the, the science is also kind of better understood by the different participants from their different angles. John, well, thanks very much. Emmanuel, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on to the end of uh, Decibel's comments. No, I think you said it all. So we can cross over to the food side now, and I'm really pleased to say that Wolfgang's camera is now working so we can see you, which is very nice. So Wolfgang, how does EFSA, so we, we touched a little bit earlier on how EFSA supports novel um, products and processes, but could you give us a little bit more information about that? You know, because you mentioned earlier insects and of course cell cultured meat. It would be lovely to know more about how you support those through, particularly from early stage companies coming in. I think for EFSA um, and as a consequence for, for applicants, it is very important for us to, to follow certain trends and uh, to anticipate what kind of uh, novel products, novel foods uh, may come to, to us, to EFSA and, and to the market in order to be prepared. And uh, what can I say, it's the most important thing not to sit in a ivory tower to engage in, in meetings also like this today, but also in, in more uh, scientific meetings um, about trends in, in food technology. Uh, we saw years before coming that uh, insects will be a, uh, a big trend. Uh, since two, three years, we see that also cultured uh, meat, cell culture, um, uh, to produce meat or, or, or plant-based products from cell culture will be maybe a trend. We see it already from other uh, regions of, of the world and, and similar with cannabis, your whole CBD, cannabis extracts, uh, these, these are trends um, you, have to, you have to catch up and the best way is network, um, uh, accepting invitations to scientific meetings, um, to meet with member states to see what, what is actually ongoing in, in, in the countries. And of course, also to engage with the European Commission uh, to detect early such, uh, such trends. In insect, it was clear, it, uh, that we had to allocate some resources, stuff to this uh, type of products. Um, EFSA also issued a, a, a risk profile for insects. 
with regards to cell culture, we clearly see this trend coming, um, but we see this trend coming since uh, two or three years at least. Um, and up to now, we only got one application for an upper cell uh, culture, noble food, but non, nothing for, for, meat, for, for a cultured meat, for example. Yeah? So we have to always to balance how much resources we can put into anticipated trends uh, to be prepared and how much resources we need for the actual work that is dropping in on, on a daily basis. And sometimes uh, we, despite anticipating things to come, we only can act uh, when they are basically here because uh, we just cannot put one or two stuff to develop a, to develop a guidance for cell culture meat if it may come in three years or four years or five years. Yeah, Maybe it's next year, the first one. Yeah. That's a, a balance we have to to be careful with our resources, um, yeah, because of the of the of the daily work we we are facing, which is enormous. Yeah? Um, similar with CBD, uh, for years we, we we have this product on the market, this cannabis extracts. Uh, it's difficult not to see them, um, um, and uh, yeah, we followed member state discussion, and and end of last year there was a, a court ruling at the European Court of Justice that uh, cannabis extracts, cannabidiol from cannabis uh, extracts per se should not be uh, considered as falling under the United Nations Single Drug, Narcotic Drug Convention from 1961. And as a consequence of that, we were anticipating applications and, and now we are facing the first four, four or five applications. The Commission has another 100 on CBD. Um, but that was very difficult to anticipate because the European Court of Justice could have ruled very different and many were expecting that they actually would rule in a different way. And then if you put resources there and then uh, at the end you may not need it, it's also not very responsible to, to deal with our resources. So it's a balance. Sometimes I wished we had more resources and uh, I think that's one of the next points I, I would come. But Again, the most important for us is to engage with stakeholders, to to discuss with industry, to to accept invitations, uh, to see where they are already working. It takes often years uh, until we get an application, and we should not miss uh, big trends to come. Now. No, thank you very much. And it's it's always really interesting. And I could literally use the terrible um, comparison and say it is literally the chicken and the egg. Which one will come first? The guidance or the applications. So it's uh... yeah. If I can add, um, novel foods are extremely diverse food category. N food enzymes are enzymes, and food additives are flavorings or colorants. There are certain groups of, but novel foods can be really almost everything. It's from insects. It's very synthetic products. It's the cell culture meat. It can be also traditional foods from third countries that have been consumed in other countries, like fungus or, or certain plants. Yeah. And for some of these products, we, we, we get two or three applications or one in 10 years. And then this applicant asking, yeah, but why you don't have a guidance for our novel food? Yeah. <laughs> Other novel foods like insects, for example, that, 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 that would have been worth maybe to have the kind of uh, dedicated, uh, more specific uh, guidance to this, but it's very difficult to balance, to balance where we need additional guidance and, and where we have to just follow the, the more common novel food guidance because at the end of the day it fits it fits to all kind of novel foods. Yeah? But this balance is, is challenging daily. Yeah. No, it'll be fascinating to come back and ask the same question next year as well, because we certainly see in our EFIB conference, which will be next week, that we have a, a huge diversity of speakers and technologies being presented around novel foods and feeds. So it will be fascinating to see which gain traction, both from a consumer perspective and also you know, their, their route through the regulatory pathway. But uh, I think oh, if it's okay, I will stay with you for a moment, Wolfgang, and ask, as you already mentioned, foods being you know, originating from other places. But this takes to my next question, which is how does Europe differ in regulation? compared to other countries, you know, we've got the US, but you're talking about sort of insect based foods, which may come from Africa or Asia, you know, how do the different regulatory agencies approach food regulations? 
that's difficult for me to answer because I'm I'm more in the science and not so much. We, we have to apply the novel food guidance. That's my daily job. Um, and I'm not, I don't have so much insight in, in how the FDA is or other countries on this planet uh, are dealing with uh, novel foods. To some extent, there are similarities with uh, New Zealand and, and Australia when it comes to novel foods. With the FDA, maybe a big difference is that uh, the applicant is basically engaging uh, an expert committee. And uh, this expert committee is basically taking kind of draft uh, assessment of the applicant, then they're reviewing, they may add, um, and then at the end of the day, the applicant is filing a CRAS notice, a generally uh, recognized as safe uh, dossier to the FD, and then the FD has 100 days time to comment, and ideally for the company, the FD has no comments, and then it's automatically approved, that goes very fast in, in the best case. And in, in Europe, it's uh, also the applicant there, they have to make a dossier that also is somehow similar to a grass notice uh, when it comes to novel foods. But there, uh, EFSA has basically, we should make an opinion that's in the regulation that we have to issue an opinion that of course should be transparent. It should be conclusive. Uh, all the key elements should be there why a novel food is considered safe. Uh, by our experts, while the FDA basically they can be silent, um, and and you get the authorization directly. Yeah? That's for me the big difference to the FDA. But I'm sure the regulatory people there are more familiar uh, with other countries than Europe. No, I think well, it's it's great. To, it's really interesting to see the sort of opposing approaches between Europe and the US for novel foods. And I'll hand over to uh, Wazan, for example, say, or how does this happen within the medicine side of things? Whether that's Emmanuel or Decibel answering this one. Well, f first of all, um, before I let Decibel answer the question, I really would like to say that there's a major difference in the review process, uh, which is uh, the fact that the FDA is a full blown institution with a, a lot of reviewers and uh, in Europe, we have a much more limited uh, group of people and we make use of external experts. So this creates already a major difference because the review at FDA is made from bottom to top. On the contrary, at EMA, they start reviewing the, um, the summaries first and only when they have a question, they go in depth into the um, well, well, into the data itself. So uh, it makes a, a major difference and obviously the reviews are completely different. But Decibel, uh, you wanted to elaborate on this. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, uh, that there's, um, I mean, when, when you speak about a country of the size of the states and having an, uh, a body like the FDA or ruling the, the whole country. I mean, it's certainly much more centralized than on the European aspect. Well, however, what needs to, one needs to acknowledge that uh, the, the EMA is a great undertaking in terms of collaborative efforts to review the uh, innovative drugs and so forth uh, for the interest of the U uh, European citizens. So, uh, it's, a, it's a probably certainly a different approach that the top down versus the bottom up. Uh, the, 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 the question lies as well on how much the different member states are willing to, to put everything in the same nest, so to speak. So, to a certain extent, the MI is, uh, and, and the national agencies, they embody what happens at the European level. The consensus is a, was one of the drivers. We managed to put uh, uh, the, an overarching body like the EMA, which is, co which is coordinating uh, the, the, the policy of the European Commission. Uh, giving the final approval. So it's uh, it's pro probably can be seen as more cumbersome. It has this, uh, its advantages and disadvantages. Um, wh what is true is that, that, that the fragmentation can be, could be seen as a hurdle when it comes to new developers, whether especially the small uh, medium enterprises and, and, and academia. Uh, Still, there is also this possibility, as I mentioned a bit earlier, to take advantage of the, of um, your national agency to 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 help out at the stage to understand your product. And I've I've been involved into into uh, into projects whereby the national agency 
why don't you also consider the EMA for the much higher level views to reach the mount the top of the mountain? We can help at our level with regards to the entry into human and also even and speaking of GMO, um, helping you with the, the deliberate release aspects of the drug development in our country because we know the body, and uh, and that's that's one of the things that one needs to to take into account. It's not one size fits all, uh, dependent on the resources and dependent also on the target audience. I mean, the, the integration is different, but in the end, uh, there are commonalities. The interpretation of the of the science in the end is is, is also balanced uh, according to the to those who review that. That's true, unfortunately or fortunately. Now, I, I'd like to mention to, yeah, when sorry. it comes to very specific items. It's again in terms of innovative aspects. Uh, there is a clear communication between FDA and the EMA, especially the Committee for Advanced Therapies. Uh, and, and because of the COVID, you see also the kind of efforts uh, between FDA and EMA to, to have, for instance, the pediatric plans, which are mandatory in Europe, and the PSP plans. Uh, even though these are independent, of course, there's already a, a, a kind of workshops between the two agencies to take advantage of the COVID, uh, unfortunately, to take advantage of the COVID to speed up. It's also to to identify the, the the let's say even in the tech in in the technical documents to see what pieces can help. And that's between the PSP and the PIP. And also, I'd like to stress the um, the fact that when it comes to innovation, let's take an example. Uh, now, modeling and simulation are entering into drug development, and and the whole world acknowledges that and wants to make it happen. The thing is, at FDA, they were able immediately in the, uh, to react to, to the need from industry, and they created the Model Informed Drug Development Group, you know, which is pharmacologists and also people who are really educated in, in IT. And therefore, these guys are able to really speak both with the regulatory people in, from the, the sponsor, but also they can speak with the modelers themselves. Whereas in Europe, they find a huge interest, of course, to, to this, these new technologies and these new ways of accelerating drug development. However, they do not have enough resources. So they're struggling with the lack of resources and Europe doesn't go as fast as FDA does. So uh, the big, big message here is we need more resources at the regulatory agencies in Europe to make things happen faster and more um, efficiently. Well, thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed, Emmanuel. And it, it is super interesting to see how, because it's it's really about how you facilitate all these experts to come together. It, it's not the lack of will to do it. It's the complexity, especially when you throw in 27 member states into the equation as well. But I'm going to move on now to our final question, which was a philosophical challenge uh, to all of our panel members. And I'm going to go back to Anna Maria first. If you could change one thing in the regulatory framework that you have to deal with, what would that be? So, Anna Maria. Only one? Okay, I'll try to keep it to <laughs> only one for the sake of time. What could be a new thing? <laughs> I, I think here um, the the important thing is is we're all acknowledging how both industry, academia, and the authorities, we're all learning. And this is a, and nobody knows what is gonna be coming as these technologies continue to develop and innovation will be going very fast. So I think here, the, the important thing is the collaborative aspect of what we're saying. It was great to hear from Wolfgang, the, the importance of networking and participating in a, in um, academic and, uh, I'm sorry, scientific exchanges. But I think here, um, what could help Wolfgang <laughs> is, is really the, the, um, the message I said earlier about focusing the regulations on the end products and not the methods because these technologies will continue to evolve and, and, um, and that could possibly um, free up some resources when you're focusing really on the safety aspects of the products at the end 
versus all the, the, the different ways that these products will be continued to be made in the future. So all, all in all, it's, it's really to, to take a more risk focused approach versus maybe the hazard focused approach that the EU traditionally does. Um, but we think that really is, is so important as we embrace the fact that new innovation is going to be coming our way to really de deliver more and more sustainable products as, as the EU continues to increase its ambitions for, for sustainability and climate change. And so that was the main message, but the little one underneath is really um, what I mentioned about having a more interactive and collaborative approach um, with civil society and industry, as in a way in the US it happens. Um, the US approach is, is not, it's different, but you don't see more incidents of, um, of safety issues in the US versus the EU. They both have a very safe supply. So somehow a, a more um, collaborative and engaging approach with industry and using these concepts like safe strange lineage or grass are, are something to consider for the EU. Thank you. That's a little great, bit more Andrea. than one. <laughs> <laughs> I will let you have that. Right, but I think it's a really relevant point, particularly when you come to the use of microorganisms, for example, because this is not in the field. This is containerized, so it's not. Yeah, the, the conversation is slightly narrower in terms of what the impact of this novel food is, even if it's not a novel food, but a change in process in its production. So thank you so much for that. That's great. So I'll hop back over to CSL now and Damien. You've had plenty of time to think about what one thing you would change inside the regulatory frameworks, so or what would that be? Uh, one thing's always difficult, right? But um, I'll endeavor to give you what you're asking for. So I think predictability um, in in how different sort of models and data are going to be extrapolated to inform some of the impl or the decisions around products that inherently have a very long durability, but at the time at which they're sort of approved, there may be a more limited data set to sort of um, interpret. And I think the point around modeling, which was just raised by one of the colleagues on the panel, I think is a very, very important one, because I think as we become um, more accomplished in how we evaluate the um, effectiveness of ATMPs, whether it be cell gene therapy or others, that come to market with a relatively short sort of um, data package in terms of efficacy durability, but the promise of many more years, even decades beyond of that, I think is something that we need to really get to grips with and address. Because without wanting to sound like a broken record, unless we're able to have new approaches to sort of um, analytics that are reliable and accepted by both regulators and payers for market access purposes, that is going to create an inherent sort of challenge for the industry, you know, for the foreseeable future. So I think if there was one thing that I would sort of really ask for, um, it would be to embrace that, move at pace, and sort of scale up the capability to embed it in the um, systems as quickly as possible. No, I think that's a great point. And, and you know, as the complexity of medicines increase, the complexity of their analytical processes need to move, you know, accepted by regulatory it, within the regulatory pathway needs to advance as well, because obviously otherwise things just become more and more expensive and slower and slower to get where they're going. So it's it's an exciting challenge. So thank you very much for that, Damien. So I'll move over to the more sort of regulatory uh, experts in the room now and go back to Wolfgang in EFSA and say, what would you change within the regulatory system? And obviously your answer is not legally binding on EFSA in any way. Okay. It was mentioned the resources. Um, whenever there's a new regulation coming, it's centralizing uh, the task from member states to EFSA. And I, I would guess that um, a lot of member states uh, uh, they they would not they would got free resources and or or, or positions that are not replaced anymore uh, when uh, an issue or when when a regulatory uh, category is is moved to EFSA. I, I wish EFSA would gain um, at least some part of the of these resources, especially when we see now here a ten times increase of of novel foods 
I would like to get at least some of the resources from member states. That would be nice or a kind of aliquot. Another point, uh, regulatory science, I agree, methods are extremely important. I would love to see uh, the process of validating methods to be used for risk assessment uh, to advance. I don't know who could do that, maybe commissions, GRCs, um, but we see a lot of uh, ongoing work at academia. I'm seeing omics now. Uh, we know, we follow them, but it's very, very difficult to apply new methods in the classical risk assessment approach because many methods have not been properly validated. So validation is key. And last issue, I would like to re respond to Anna Maria on FDA and, and, UA, and, and Europe uh, with the argument that incidence of food safety issues are not higher in the US as compared to Europe. Uh, incidence in, in, in of food safety issues are extremely, have very, very low sensitivity, meaning it's very difficult to detect a safety issue when it comes to chronic effects, almost impossible, I would say. So I would be really careful to use this as an argument to, to basically to imply that uh, we have the same level of safety when it comes to new products on the market. It's my personal opinion because I also, I also cannot prove the contrary. Um, but at least my perception is that, that our hazard-based approach, I agree, that's a bit different from the risk from the risk uh, oriented approach. I think there is also a scientific base for that when it comes to the production process, to the source, uh, to look for hazards because at the end they may end up in the product without detecting them or without realizing in a 90 day study, in a toxicological study, that you have an issue there. Because also animal studies are only proximates. They, they, they will always have an uncertainty uh, leaving for humans and, and we only extrapolate then from animals to human. And I think this hazard oriented approach, it adds, it reduces uh, uncertainties when it comes to novel products on the market. Eh? I think those are all really good points. And of course, we all wish you at EFSA were going to have lots more resources and people to uh, to keep you up to pace with the amount of innovation coming through the pipeline towards you. And I think your last point back to uh, Anna Maria was very interesting, of course, because food production is an incredibly long chain. And so a food can be approved, but many other safety incidents will arise in its lifetime. They've got nothing to do with the food itself, but it's processing and its disposal as well. So it's uh, it shows the complexity of the food supply chain and how they are quite different between Europe and the US in that respect. So thank you very much, Wolfgang, for your things that you would change. And so I move finally back over into the medical area and we'll close with Voisin and your one wish for a regulatory change. So let's start with Emmanuel, because you've said less so far in the uh, panel. One wish, well, more resources and more partnering with your, 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 well, with the regulatory agencies for sure. But I will let this Ibal speak about his. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually, probably uh, in, in trying to encapsulate everything we've said, and especially uh, into uh, this world uh, where we're trying to be sustainable. Uh, you recall and probably we all know as, as sensitive, sensitive to the concept of the three R's applied in a, in a animal testing the reduce, reuse and recycle uh, and try to, to find the, uh, apply the same con concepts when it comes to development of products in an ethical framework with all these GDPR aspects such a, and uh, how to reduce that, how to reuse and recycle the amount of data we gather so that we are, we are sustainable by applying the in silico, the real world evidence and the well controlled studies as, a, as a three pillars during the drug development. Uh, I, th I guess that this would be uh, something that we, we, we need to focus upon and help uh, uh, develop as much as possible, especially for this, the different elements helping out with a, with a clear uh, support towards the payers uh, and uh, to, to support uh, the, the, the argument of a new drug into the existing armamentarium. I think that uh, the three R's apply to clinical development hand in hand. I guess that would be a nice uh, achievement uh, in the end. I think that's a really nice uh, sentiment to end on, in fact, because the three R's could be applied into everything. It's just as relevant on the food development side as the medicine side. And the discussion around data is exactly it. As we want to move to more in silico models for everything and more you know, safety assessment of, um, you know, 
um, sort of different assays they come into play for safety you know, for development of products and processes. The three R's are absolutely critical to this. And I think where, this is where Europe generates a huge amount of knowledge across all of its countries from its very deep innovation base. And making better and more effective use of that is something we absolutely have to do. So I would like to say thank you very much indeed to all of our panelists today. It was really great to hear from you. And we got past the excitement of uh, WebEx moving people around at the beginning um, and had a really interesting conversation with everybody. So I say thank you once again, and we will make the recording either in its entirety or chopped up into interesting subsections available for everybody to access. So thank you once again, and we hope you have a really excellent Biotech Week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.